native code on the web. Right now, you can write applications in any language you want, as long as it's JavaScript. So this is a funny thing to complain about, as this is JSConf. But if you take a look at the larger arc, right now, JavaScript has a very privileged position on the web. And all other platforms usually have a way that they can call out to C or C++ or some other language. And this creates a lot of lost opportunity costs, such as integrating with existing libraries or making it easy to port between cell phone applications and the web and things along those lines. So before we get into the nitty gritty of native code, it's worth remembering why we love the web. The web is secure. And by secure, we mean that you can point your web browser at nearly any website, run the application, and not worry that it'll upload your financial information to some arbitrary website. So cat videos, no theft. That's a good thing. The web is portable. You can view it on any computer, any operating system, as long as there's a web browser. You can view it from your cell phone. It's, it just runs everywhere there's a web browser. This is great. It's ephemeral, so you don't have to install anything. You just point your web browser, go. You don't have to uninstall anything. You don't have to have automatic computer cleanup or anything like that. That's all uh, done in the cache. And the web is, well, not very w compatible with other platforms. It's kind of its own, own island. So the reason this is, is because of all the things that make the web good. So the web is secure. Well, this doesn't mean that native applications are insecure. It just means that they have an entirely different definition of what this means. So on the web, it assumes your application is running on behalf of where you get it from, whereas when you run your native application, it assumes it's running on behalf of you. So the native application can access your financial information because it's you. And native applications are typically compiled down onto the machine, so they, aren't, they haven't traditionally been built for portability, and you typically install these. So um, we'll get to plugins in a moment, but if you have to install something on the web, you lose 90% of your users, 70, 90% of your users right there. So if we want native code to work on the web, it has to behave like the web. It has to be secure, portable, and ephemeral. We've tried this. So everyone remembers NPAPI, Flash, Java, ActiveX. Uh, some people even, even tried to hack the browser in order to get this working. And these ultimately, these approaches fall down because it's JavaScript, it's web content, which calls into native code, and then the native code tries to do its best job pretending it's just as secure as JavaScript. But ultimately, there are security exploits, and you only get security that's as good as the weakest link in the chain. So Gen 2 is people finally learned from the pain and said, why don't we try to do things which behave as if they are web content? They're secure, portable, ephemeral. So there is portable native client, uh, which is in Chrome and allows you to take a portable uh, binary, essentially, and run it inside your web browser. And then there's mscripten, which compiles native code into JavaScript. And this is one of the main reasons that this is going to be talked about at JSConf, is because it concerns uh, JavaScript and what the future of JavaScript could be to support this kind of workflow. And a lot of you have probably heard of asm.js, and this is actually what happens after mscripten gets a hold of it, is it describes a specific format that mscripten generates. So for this talk, I will be talking about mscripten, but in your mind, you can wildcard that to asm.js if you wish. Pinnacle, portable native client, uh, works like a traditional compiler, is you take a bunch of C++ source files, you pass it to a slightly modified version of LLVM, and it produces a portable executable. This portable executable is a serialization of LVM's internal format. Then inside the browser, your web page says, hey, I want to embed this portable executable. So Chrome grabs it, downloads it, and then looks at it and says, hey, I can't actually run portable code. You know, my processor isn't portable, it's a real processor. So then it goes and translates it into what the local code is. And it does a few tricks to make sure we can verify the code is safe. So at runtime, you get a setup that's a little bit like this is that there's a NACL process running these specially generated machine instructions, which is your native code executing. And then when it, want to interact, when it wants to interact with the web page, it does post message. So JavaScript is sitting there, can send messages back and forth, 
And one of the issues is that you don't have direct access to the DOM. So the DOM is very much single-threaded, only accessible by JavaScript, and it's very jealous of this fact. So you typically have to have some glue if you want to modify the actual web page. An interesting thing is that when you have a NACL process, it can only talk to the browser. It cannot talk directly to the operating system. And this means that the browser notion of security is preserved. So you can't access an arbitrary file on the disk, but you can get any URL that JavaScript would be able to get. And the API that this is done with is called Pepper, and it's essentially functionally equivalent with what JavaScript has in terms of XML, HTTP request, WebGL. It's just a different language binding for that. MScripten, on the other hand, takes the approach where it says, here's some C code, and I'm going to do some transformations on it, so it's actually semantically equivalent JavaScript. So this is an add function, which is prettied up a little bit to use pointers, so we actually see some memory operations in the output. But it's more or less what you'd expect. If you kind of squint through all the cruft in there, there's a load from memory, another load from memory, and then it adds together. So you'll see there's a lot of or zeros in there, and these are bitwise operations where you're doing a bitwise or with zero, which if you know how or works, that should be a no-op. You know, or with zero equals what you put in. But the trick is, is that JavaScript coerces anything you or with zero into a 32-bit integer. So if you have a string or if you have a double, it'll mangle it until it looks like an integer, and then you can do operations on it. So this is what ASM is, is they've essentially smuggled in type annotations to the language by exploiting the semantics of JavaScript. Really weird corner cases. Another thing to pay attention to is that a memory access, where you're just saying, hey, I want this address in memory, is transformed into an indexed operation, an index operation into a typed array. So if you're familiar with array buffers and typed array views, that's what's going on in the bottom, is it's taking a pointer, and because the array view, the indexing isn't byte for byte, instead, like if it's a 32-bit integer, it's indexing four bytes at a time, you have to drop the lower two bits of the address, divide it by four. So that turns a pointer address into an array index. Interesting consequences of this is that the address you look up isn't exactly the address you'd normally get in native code. Usually it doesn't matter, but there's a few corner cases where dropping the lower two bits can bite you. There's also the question of null pointers. So C typically says this, the pointer zero is in some ways equivalent to null or undefined in JavaScript, is it just means there's nothing there, and you should always check if it's null before you use it. But if you use null in this case, it's like, well, let me get address at, uh, data at address zero. Oh, here's the data at address zero. So it doesn't complain. Usually with native code, it will kill the process or something along those lines. At runtime, when you use mscript, it looks like this, is your compiled code is actually running inside the, the very same thread as the rest of the JavaScript code. And when you want to call out of the compiled code, it's just calling a JavaScript function. So it's a very quick synchronous bridge. So with a little bit of wrapping, you can get synchronous access to the DOM. And both the compiled code and the JS code has access to this big array, which it says is equivalent to the native machine's memory. The consequences of this approach is that your native code is sharing the same thread as JavaScript, which means that it has to obey the same rules as JavaScript. It can't block. You have to periodically rel relinquish control, and there's no other threads. So this means that if you're porting to use mscripten, you have to sp potentially spend a lot of time refactoring your code so that it behaves like JavaScript. It's asynchronous, callback-driven. And for some native applications, this is a step too far. So a lot of the stuff we see nowadays that's being compiled to the web is the stuff that works easily, but there's still a lot of stuff we haven't been able to do because of the blocking and threading issues. This leaves you with a dilemma, is you can go pinnacle and you say, hey, it has threads, it's a little bit faster, it's closer to what we expect, there's fewer gotchas, but on the other hand, if we go the mscripten approach, it runs everywhere JavaScript runs, and in many cases, it's easier just to synchronously access the DOM. You don't have asynchronous post messages. So it's a dilemma, is we have two not yet perfect solutions, and what can we do? It turns out that these solutions are actually closer in many ways than you'd expect. They're both built on top of the LLVM toolchain, and they both are trying to produce portable native code. So a lot of the tricks you have to do to get portable native code working, they're both doing the same thing. So I thought, why not create a polyfill that provides Pinnacle's interface to mscripten, 
So if you're willing to get rid of your threads and you're willing to make sure your program's asynchronous, then you can take the same code base and compile it using both technologies. And I, I call this PepperJS because it's a JS polyfill of the Pepper interface. Abstractly, that's fairly straightforward, but actually seeing it in action. These are native client examples, SDK examples. This is a ray traced earth. It's doing this all on the CPU. There's no GPU involved. And here's the pinnacle version of the same thing. Uh, you don't notice many differences. The one difference, of course, is that if you go to the pinnacle version over here, you can turn on more threads. And it's very hard to see on the VC, but you do get a uh, speed up when you're doing that. And uh, you know, there's other CPU uh, examples where you can uh, just crank on the threads, see it go faster. Uh, exactly the M same uh, code working with mscripten. But there's corner cases like this, is if you're GPU bound, it really doesn't matter how fast you are. So exactly the same application, mostly driving the CPU. So in terms of performance, is mscripten actually does very good, especially with numerical kernels. So things like Earth, it's usually within 1x. You know, it's like 20% slower. Whereas when you have more structured code, you're kind of in the uh, 2 to 3x range in terms of performance. So the performance is mostly there. It's more an issue of developer time and structure. How much time are you willing to de uh, how much time are you willing to spend to dethread your code? Well, why would you want threads? So I've been pounding on this is that it's structure. Is modern developers, they want to target as many platforms as possible. You know, they want to run on cell phones, they'd like to run on the web, but it's all a return on investment issue. Is how much time are you willing to get that next platform and support that next platform? And if that, if that cost is too much, you just don't do it. Uh, there's throughput. We'll see in a, a moment that if you have more threads, you can just crunch more numbers and do more calculations. There's also latency. So if you're doing audio or rendering or real-time stuff, throughput is kind of the equation, but you want to get it done as, or kind of the question, but you want to get it done as fast as possible. So you never want to have dropouts in your audio. You never want to drop frames in your real-time application. There's also a trend in hardware where we're getting more and more cores. And an individual core can run code about the same speed as it always has. And if you want your overall application to run faster, you have to take advantage of the parallel resources in your hardware. I should uh, clarify before I go on, I'm kind of using the uh, definition that the Go programming language has uh, done for concurrency and parallelism, is that they're not the same thing. So parallelism is about doing things at the same time. So if you have multiple CPUs, you're running things on multiple CPUs, that's parallelism. Whereas concurrency is really about dealing with the conflicts that arise when you're doing things that interact. So even if you're running on a single CPU, you can think in JavaScript, you have problems with concurrency when you load a bunch of files, and then they may come back not quite in the order that you expect. So you have to deal with the oh, they've resolved in different orders, let me order them, then let me go on, things along those lines. Whereas parallelism, you get that when you actually load the file. So while the system is actually grabbing the bytes off the network, that's parallelism, but it doesn't interact with JavaScript until you get the event back, and that's concurrency. So what if we changed how the browser worked a little bit? What, instead, what if instead of just running everything inside the main thread, we spun up a few workers? So a web worker is essentially a thread, but you can't interact with all the other threads the way you'd want to with native code because you can only communicate through messages. So what if we just gave it a big chunk of memory and said this chunk of memory can be simultaneously read and written to from all of these different workers? And then you provide some mechanisms along the lines of locks and semaphores to make sure that you're never reading or writing from the same memory at the same time. Instead, you're passing ownership uh, back and forth between the threads. So this should horrify a few people in this audience, is that shared memory is known to be hard. And a lot of the design of JavaScript has been shared nothing. Instead of uh, dealing with all these concurrency issues, the only way you can communicate back and forth is over messages. So this is the downside of shared memory, is it kind of is going another direction. It's saying if we really want native code on the web, we have to deal with the uh, issues of shared memory. So people will often say, well, there's all these other ways we could do it. And I don't have time to go through these one by one, but it always comes down to there's something missing. And usually what it comes down to is that 
whatever solution we do has to be incremental, an incremental evolution of JavaScript. And it also has to require minimal changes to the native code. And there's very few solutions which solve both those. For instance, you say, well, why does JavaScript have to have anything to do with this? Why are we compiling to JavaScript? Why not just use Pinnacle? Well, that's another technology stack. And getting other browsers to adopt it is much harder than incrementally evolving JavaScript. So I think in the future, we're going to see a convergence, is that what's happening in MScript and what's happening in Pinnacle will uh, start to look uh, similar and similar. But we potentially have to evolve JavaScript to get to that point. So how do we prove that this all works? Well, um, I put together, uh, probably shouldn't have popped up, a uh, fluid simulator. And I'm wiggling with my mouse here, and it's tiled, and uh, everything like that. So what's happening is underneath all this, there is a grid of velocities. And this is a visualization of the velocity grid right there. And as you swir swirl it around with the mouse, the fluid flows with it. And this is a grid. It's a two by two grid of image data, essentially, and velocity data. And every step, it's doing a lot of calculation to move it forward. So this is all CPU driven. This is one of these things that you think could be very easily parallelized. And so I tried to do it with the existing workers' APIs. So here's a version where I'm splitting it up into multiple workers. And one thing we'll get back to is you'll kind of see, although it's very hard, you'll have to squint, is that the velocity buffers, when I draw into it, the lines are now kind of uh, lumpy, as they aren't as smooth as they were the first time. And we'll get to why that was. But this is running on multiple workers. Right now, it's, in fact, running on four workers. And if you look at the actual uh, bottom graph, you see virtually no improvement. In fact, you'll see a lot of spikes popping up. And those are due to garbage collection pressure because you're copying things to the worker every time. Well, what if you can reduce the copying? So this version says that instead of copying the same data to all four workers, you copy it once and say, here's a read-only buffer that everyone can access. So it reduces the number of copies. And you'll see that a lot of the spikes go away. So as it turns out, the big win from uh, not having to broadcast the same data to everyone is not actually the cost of copying the data. It's the copy of cleaning the data up afterwards. So read-only memory gives you a performance boost due to being friendly for GC. What if we go a step further and, say, have shared memory? And instead of using post message to talk back and forth, we use traditional native mechanisms like locks to coordinate between the threads. So at this point, we see, actually see our first performance improvement. And as it turns out, this is due to communication more than anything else. So when you have a lock, that allows you to communicate with the other threads much quicker than post message does. We'll get into the actual performance numbers uh, uh, when we, in a future slide. So this is what's going on behind the scenes, is that uh, it's doing a bunch of computations. You don't have to know exactly what these are, but like the EVEC stages, they're just moving things around, uh, diffuse velocity, that simulates viscosity. And then it has to make sure that there's no fluid appearing from nowhere or disappearing. So it makes sure that the pressure is equal at all times, and then it'll draw. How you parallelize this is you take the computationally intensive stages and you move them out to a worker. So you're um, doing post message out. The worker says, thank you for the data, does the computation, sends the results back. And you periodically have to uh, resynchronize back. I mentioned that some of the lines become blotchy. And it's because as soon as you start parallelizing it, there's these gaps that open up on the main thread. And these gaps are potentially places where things like mouse events can fire. So I did a lot of beautiful abstraction. I used promises. I said, here are all the things the fluid simulation is doing. And then I changed the back end implementation detail. And suddenly, events started firing in places I didn't even think about that they'd fire. So this is a concurrency bug, is we're dealing with unexpected events in places we didn't expect. So the great irony is when dealing with shared memory, my concurrency bug that I ran into was JavaScript. When you actually look at the speed up, um, uh, shared nothing and read-only memory, they give modest improvements. And then when you start using these fast synchronization primitives, you can actually start to use all the cores. So on eight cores, only a 4x speed up, so that's 50% efficiency. So it's not quite where we'd want to be, and there's other things that need to be done. But this is a kind of quick hand-waving hack to show that shared memory does work, and it does give you uh, parallel speed up and performance improvement. I'm going to skip these slides for the sake of time, but the message or the, the lesson learned is that 
the main thread is actually more special than you'd expect. So the workers aren't entirely independent with the main thread. And if you block the main thread, you can, for instance, prevent a worker from ever creating or from ever being created. So when you initially create it, it creates a stub. And it also launches off an URL request to get the script that's supposed to run inside the stub. So if you block the main thread, the script itself is never loaded and the worker never becomes active. And there are similar issues where if you block the main thread while a worker is doing something, the console log gets proxied through the main thread to wherever the console is. And this means you'll lose output if the main thread is blocked. So for programmers, you shouldn't worry about this. But in terms of the browser implementation, it turns out there's all sorts of complexities where blocking the main thread will kill you. And this is a problem for running native code because it's a blocking API. Another thing that freaks people out about native code is data races. And this is a classic textbook, I took CS, I took operating systems thing, is you say, I have these two threads, they each have two instructions in them, and I'm going to run them at the same time, what happens? So one thread assigns the value 1 to A. So assume that A and B are both 0 to start out with. So one thread assigns 1 to A, then prints B. The other thread assigns 2 to B, and then prints A. So what's the end result? If you look at the interleavings of these threads, you get six possible results. It can print two, it can print one, then one, it can print one, then two. If one of the threads runs much faster than the other ones, you get a zero, then a one, or a zero, then a two. So this isn't the worst thing in the world, it is you got two threads, two instructions, six possible interleavings. We can deal with that. I, I, I lied. So it, it's a little worse than that, is that the compiler and the CPU, there's all sorts of things down the stack which will try to make the code run faster. And one of the normal things they'll say is, well, you're assigning to A, then you're printing B. These two operations are totally unrelated, so I can reorder them as I wish. And the other thread will say the same thing, is assigning to B, then printing A, no relation, I can reorder them. So instead you have 24 different operations, and some of them will produce things which are intuitively silly. Like one, uh, you can print zero, zero which never should happen because by the time you hit the other print, you would have thought that the other thread would have assigned to what you're printing. So there should never be a second zero. And you can sometimes get two zero. Again, these are physically unrealizable. But it gets worse, is for optimization purposes, either the CPU or the compiler can duplicate instructions. It can remove instructions. It can transform the instructions. So instead of 24 interleavings, there's actually effectively an uncountable number of interleavings that can occur with these threads and even worse, is different threads may not agree on what the interleavings are. So if the memory operations aren't dependent, they can say, hey, A got assigned to you, then B, and the other is saying, no, B got assigned to you, then A. And not every computer will run the same way. So different CPUs will show some orderings, but not all of them. And different compilers will show some orderings, not all of them. And this is especially a problem for JavaScript because the JIT actually behaves as multiple compilers. So as you run, it will recompile the code and potentially reorder things in different ways every time it optimizes the code. So th this is hopeless, right? It, it, when it comes down to it, if you have a data race, your program is broken. So you'll see a lot of people, they'll squint and say, okay, there's a data race there, but it, it'll be okay. And the answer is no, is that uh, the compiler of the CPU is going to do the worst possible thing in some cases, and you can't reason about it. So you must defensively not have data races in your program. Well, this would be a good argument against native code on the web, right? Data, data races are awful. But really, this is about concurrency, is we're talking about doing interacting things at the same time. And if you don't account for these interactions, your program is broken. This also occurs in JavaScript. And I think one of the things that we'll be learning over the next five years is that concurrency is a bigger problem for JavaScript than we currently understand. Things like URL requests coming back in the order we didn't expect is we've dealt with asynchrony with promises, but if you have two promise chains that are interleaving with each other in odd ways, how do you deal with that? What primitives do you use? And right now, this is mostly put upon the programmer to deal with. So this is a wicked problem, but it's a generically wicked problem. And so can we do better? Is there a way that we can eliminate data races? And having thought about it for a while, I can say, no, not really. Is if you want to emulate a platform, if you want to be compatible with a platform, you also be, have to be compatible with their bugs to some extent. And 
What this means is that JavaScript may have to have a shared memory API for compiled to JavaScript, which you probably shouldn't use otherwise, and that scares people. So where is this going? Is there anything certain? And at this point, there is nothing certain. There is going to be a bit of a discussion slash war for the soul of JavaScript, whether we want to support native code on the web, whether we're willing to expose shared memory. If the um, ultimate uh, gain from it is supporting multi-threaded native code, so you can just mash together everything. You can mash C with JavaScript. It's not just mashing different web apps together anymore. I got through that faster than I expected. Um, but if you want to know more, there's websites for Knackle, Mscripten, uh, TryPepper, uh, js.appspot.com for some of the examples I was showing. Uh, tweet at native client, one of my coworkers a troll. He'll enjoy it. And uh, email me if you have anything uh, to talk about. And I think we have four minutes, and we might actually be able to take questions for the first time ever. So anyone curious about anything? OK, so the question is, are there potential optimizations where you can just uh, copy stuff into shared memory and pass a pointer to workers. And that's essentially what the fluid simulator was doing, is that it had this grid of data, and it was saying, each of these threads, you're responsible for calculating the next version of this data for this specific subsquare. So it was, a, it was essentially handing the pointer off to the worker in you know, kind of a region of memory and said, process this and give me the result. So for the non-shared memory version, what it was doing it was, it was actually copying out that chunk and sending it over. And it was a little worse than that because post message takes about a millisecond uh, to do a full round trip. You know, it has a high throughput, but potentially also a high latency. And because of the high latency, when you're actually doing the fluid simulator, like every update, you're having to iterate about 120 times on a specific calculation called the Jacobian. So if you do that all over post message, then that means you're taking about 120 milliseconds just for communication, which obviously doesn't work. So instead, you have to do things like actually send it more data than it needs. It says, ultimately, you're responsible for this little square, but I'm going to give you data for this much, and you're going to calculate a region that's about twice as big just so you can predict what your neighbors are doing and you don't have to communicate. So when you look at those numbers where you see no speed up, what's actually going on is you're having to do uh, pretty much twice the computation in all the workers just to avoid communicating because communicating is so slow. So when you're talking about avoiding copy by passing pointers to workers, the big win is actually communication speed. Is on modern processors, copying isn't too bad as long as you don't have to GC afterwards. And if you can avoid it, you get an additional improvement, but the big improvement is with synchronization speed. Aha, so why are we backwards looking? Why are we worried about all this legacy code? Well, this is often brought up in these wars about should we have shared memory or not? And my, my answer to that is that people are still writing new native code every day. You know, everyone talks about native on mobile. So if we're talking about compatibility with native code, we're really talking about can mobile developers easily port back and forth to the web? You know, can we make the web as a last bastion of not being a walled garden, you know, if you want to be really political about it or something like that. So it's about compatibility with different platforms more than anything else. And people are saying, well, why don't we provide an isolates API? You know, why don't we say that native code just gets web workers and you have to send messages between the different threads in native code? And how are you going to get people to do that? You know, that's a huge change. So you're still asking for a world where people have to design for the web first, is they have to say, well, I am taking on these constraints where everything goes in web workers, and I'm not using any library which happens to use a thread. So there's a fairly hilarious um, discussion I saw on the mscript and IRC, where someone's like, I can't compile this library. It's saying not finding winthreads.h, or something along those lines. And then the person is like, well, you can't have threads. And they're like, I don't care if I have threads. I just want the library to work. So there, there is certain mashability things. Is you just want to put the libraries together and have it work and not worry about the underlying things. So requiring a massive rewrite of everything, that's a bit of a non-starter. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Nick.